do my normal kind of mini recap and some extra insights. Um, good comments again on the podcast show. I love the comments you guys leave out there. Um, but just uh, the, some stuff we're going to cover really quick is the uh, <laughs> subpoena with Sachs was funny. Um, talking about is this a dead cat bounce? Freeberg had some really good points about what's going on in the world. And then talking about this Taiwan visit, China, Taiwan, like there's a lot of stuff that's got me thinking right now that maybe they haven't exactly talked about. Um, world's in a, in a strange place right now. We'll leave it at that. But to begin, um, <laughs> sex and the subpoena, uh, it's, it's crazy how much money Twitter's spending right now. And it looks like they're trying to dig up any dirt possible. And I mean, that's what, I mean, look, man, it's law firms. Um, you call, I call any, I got my friends, a lawyer for 20 years. I call them for something. They try to keep you on the phone for 15 minutes so they can, so they can log that 15 minute block. And, uh, I call up and I'm like, hi, David. He's like, hi, James. Should I sign this or not? <laughs> cause he, you know, I screw with him cause he'll want to get in the seven or eight minutes of wishy washy talk to drag the call out. Like, dude, I know the game. Um, just bill me for the 15 minutes and tell me whether or not I should sign this so I can move on. I get it. Lawyers are supposed to go dig up dirt and, but it's like, if they're going to the point to where they're looking for all this almost kind of petty stuff, it makes me wonder, do they even, do they have as strong of a case as the media makes it sound? If you watch certain channels, it seems like Twitter has this in the lock, Elon screwed. And it also happens to be the channels that hate Elon that are saying Elon screwed. And then you watch some other media sources that are pro Elon, and then they'll say that, you know, Elon can, can wiggle out of this. You don't know what's true anymore because everything in the news is so goddamn biased. You don't know anymore. Everyone's got a side. It is, I keep using the anal analogy of it's like the world has turned into one big motorcycle gang versus the other. And it, it's hard to figure it out. But when I hear stuff like they're going after Saks with the subpoena to try to get private communications about this and that, it's like, if that's how far they're digging, they're either being really thorough or maybe their case isn't as strong as they made it sound. And, you know, which is funny, Saks talking about, you know, he essentially just sent a random tweet off when uh, he's going to the bathroom, which it's probably 90% of all tweets and posts on social media probably happens from the bathroom. It's like there wasn't there was no deep thought in this. It was a random thing you fling out there. And and it's you know, it's funny because, you know, when I post on my Instagram, you can follow me on Instagram at James Phillip three one three. Um, people will assume like a post is about them or they make all these assumptions and it's like I just had this random thought at a red light and I just I wrote that and posted it. Or it was a random thought from like ten years ago, like it's it's not as deep as you think it is. So the fact that you got Twitter going that deep on sex, I don't know. That was a, a funny part. They talked a little bit about the bots and Shamath, you know, again, good points he made about the experience that we've had on social media. Well, you, it's, I don't get this, you know, 5% bots. It's like when you buy the chicken in the store and it says, you know, made with 95% real chicken. And you're like, well, wait a minute, what, how much chicken were you selling me before? Well, how much broth did you inject into the chicken to get the weight up and blah, blah, blah. When I hear 5% bots, um, here's, I just want you to check this out sometime. The next something major happens. Um, I love looking for patterns. And this actually got me in trouble at a Vegas casino once before. I, for whatever reason, since I was a little kid, I've, I've been good at noticing patterns. And I was playing video kino in Vegas and... Certain machines seem like they always came up with a certain pattern, and then the next thing you know, security's tapping me on the shoulder, right? I'm about to turn into an episode of Casino. It's like, but you can see these patterns, right? And I see this on Twitter a lot. If you go hit the latest button, if you sort by latest, um, eh, not latest, what's the other one? Whatever the main feed is, I'll have to go look. Hell, you could probably do it on both. But what happens is it seems like if there's a major event one side of this, you know, there's two sides that are always arguing, right? We'll have this one point. And then you'll see that same point brought up over and over and over again by the same check, like, like people with the check marks. 
And it's like, it's not like they all came to that thought at the same time. It's almost like it's very coordinated. Um, it's very organized. And it's like, is that just a group of bots where they go out and say, okay, here's the angle we're going to push for this particular political topic. And then these accounts all seem to latch onto it. And then it gets replicated over and over by all the people that follow them. Look at that sometime, either, either the main feed or in the latest. When something, you know, if there's a, God forbid, there's another shooting or another major incident or another issue with the politician, there's always this like narrative that it's, it almost instantly pops up. And then you'll see 5, 10, 15, 20 accounts all saying this one little minute detail that tries to prove their side right. It's not natural. Like I can go pull 20 people and they would not come up with that. But how did these 20 people? So I always found that interesting that, man, social media really does manipulate us. It's it's probably one big, someone pushes a narrative, there's a bot farm that pushes it, and then boom, the world believes it. I think we're finding out about the, the plant-based meat and the fake meat right now. I just saw another, is it Beyond Meat that was laying people off? Don't quote me on that. If you got on Twitter last year, they would make you think that 90% of the world wants to eat this stuff. And then Burger King was doing it, and then McDonald's was exploring, and everyone, you know, they came out with the uh, fake chicken wings. Like, they had everything under the sun that was plant-based. But then no one would buy it. Because social media made you believe that everyone wanted it. And come to find out, a very small part of the market wants it. I think we're finding this out with movies. We're finding this out with everything that... There are these things that are pushed on social media that seems like it really is the market force, that this is the new thing. This is how everybody feels. And it's just a bunch of bots, and it's organized. <laughs> it's got to be more than 5% bots on Twitter, right? And I think that's where Chamath was getting at. It's, he turned the comments off, and he's like, this is great. This is so much better than getting spammed with all this stuff in the comment section. And I think that's why a lot of news sites turned off comments. Right, they got rid of the garbage. If you're on social media, you either turn off comments or you block people. It's such a better experience. And then, you know, people will get mad and say, well, you just want to have your voice and I can't have mine. Go have your voice on your platform. Right, and I think Chama's point is, I just want to get my message out there. And then it's like, I don't want to deal with the bots and all the crap. So, anyways, that was, that was pretty good from Chamath and Sachs. I mean, Sachs was pretty funny with the subpoena stuff. Um, Jumping into the markets, you know, Freebird killed it again. And he's got this, I've been saying this on my prior podcast. There's too many little things going on right now that has me concerned. And, and Friedberg said that same thing. It's like, okay, so I'm not the only one out there that believes this. Where, whatever, you got COVID still going. Monkeypox is now a, uh, a national health crisis. We got inflation. Obviously, the war with Russia, the escalation in Europe. Um overall energy crisis going on it's probably going to hit a little bit deeper I, we've not seen what putin's fully up to yet he's obviously playing games with the gas pipelines there's more to come we're going to get in the fall and then you know even with the heating oil diesel still expensive around here so you got all that drama going on you got the food crisis going on uh freeberg mentioned uh, the, the stuff going on in brazil and then we got this whole taiwan thing and we got that escalating and there's all this, you know, jobs and, and, and how, like, there's so many little things. And to free, you know, Freeberg's point is, it's like, you know, maybe individually they're just one thing, but the probability of one or two of those things happening now is pretty high. And that's how I felt um, till this day, probably for the last 18 months. There's too many things where th to say that none of them are going to happen. It's like, well, maybe we don't have a recession, but maybe we break out into a bigger war. And maybe we don't break out into a bigger war, and maybe we don't have a recession, but maybe there's a massive COVID outbreak again. Like, there's too many things to say none of this stuff's going to happen. Now it's a matter of which one or two or three is going to happen and when. Is it at the same time, or is it separate? So I saw some really good points there. I don't think, I mean, it's in my own opinion, I'm not giving in financial advice. I don't think the markets are done. I think things have, you know, look they look a little more rosy, and everyone's piling back into the market and cryptos for the moment. I don't, I'm still seeing layoffs across the board and that's up, you know, for the business that we have that deals with displaced workers, that's, that business is still way up and it continues to stay up. I don't think we're done yet. And you're seeing a lot of the housing 
houses are either sitting on the market around here or I just watched one lop off a half a million dollars um, on the price. There's, we have turmoil coming still in the housing market. There's a turmoil coming in the employment market. We're not done. And maybe Wall Street has that baked in. I just, I don't, I don't know if they got anything major baked in. And we're, we're going to see, you know, the job report was so strong. Now they're saying that they're going to have to really hit 75% or maybe a point in September. Because the whole thing was, Powell was saying, when we raise rates, we're going to see unemployment tick up into 2023. But now we're, we're seeing the job market kind of rage back, which kind of goes against what they're trying to beat the economy down a little bit. And it's saying, nah, it's like that fire you keep spraying water on, but you don't spray enough water on it. So it keeps popping, popping back up. So they're going to hit another rate, probably, you know, 75 or more in September. It's going to mess with mortgage rates and all that stuff. And again, we don't, I don't think we have all this, this stuff figured out yet. And I think we're in such a hurry to say, it's over, back to business, let's go. I just don't think it's we're back to business yet. There's going to be a point when it feels like things got a lot worse, and that's the bottom. Things aren't that bad. The market dropped quite a bit. Other than that, I don't know, gas price dropped. And as they pointed out, that's a demand-driven thing. Like we're Our demand's down to where we were like right around when COVID really hit. Demand's down, and that's not a good sign for the economy. So, you know, we got a slight increase in oil production and a massive drop in demand. Yeah, prices come down. But let's see what's going to happen in the fall here. Lastly, you know, they all seem confused by the Pelosi trip, as am I. And just one thing about the pod this week, you know, I get it. It's, I keep coming back to, it just seems like J. Cal, and maybe I'm wrong. It just seems like Jay Cal seems to cause a lot of the, the, the rift. He does a lot of interruption, and it's often trying to, like, defend his own ideals, especially if it's something political. And I'm like, just stop. Just stop. Let's talk money. Let's talk facts. We're not here to die on our political ideal hill. And I think if they can get over that, then the pod gets, you know, kind of back to normal. And same thing with Sachs. It's like we don't need the constant diatribe on, uh, you know, defending his side of the thing. It's let's just get that out of there. It'd be nice. Uh, stop interrupting each other. Stop dying on political ideal hills. And let's just debate facts. But they were all confused about the Pelosi trip, as am I. I had to sit back and I've asked multiple people this during the last couple of weeks. Why her? Right? Is that really... Is that in her job description? Is that what she's supposed to be doing? And then you have to ask the question of, and the pod there is saying that, you know, Secretary of State and uh, Biden said don't go. And why is she going? And is it all a plot? Is it all a ploy? I just feel like they're, they're just trying to start shit. And I, is this back to... It's America, and we just got to be starting wars and drama all the time because it's money and power. It made no sense to me for her to go on this trip. I still don't fully understand why this, we needed to go on this trip, why she needs to go on this trip. And then it gets my random brain thinking at 2 o'clock in the morning. If, if we really believe in the one China policy, right, then why is this whole thing an issue? If someone at the if number three in the country, essentially, Pelosi is going to fly into Taiwan, and we believe that it's one China, then we call China first and we ask for permission. And they either say yes or no, right? Or you just fly in there and you're acting like Taiwan's its own sovereign nation. So which one is it? In one stance, we're saying... We back one China, and another thing we're saying, well, we'll defend, we'll defend Taiwan against China. I, it's very confusing to me. I don't study this stuff all day, but my dad's like, you know, he's like, oh, you know, they might shoot her, they might shoot her plane out of the sky. I'm like, no, I have a feeling that this is probably kind of arranged. There's, there was some talk somewhere back channels that this was going to happen because if we really believe in one China. Then they, they they were also talking about like her plane skirting you know Chinese airspace. Again, if we believe it's all one, why are we skirting the airspace? If we believe it's all one, why was any of this an issue unless they told us no? So it's 
part of me wants to, to believe that in the back channels, um, China's like, go ahead and go, and then you can take credit for going, and then we're going to go bolster up over here so we can, like, you know, get the home team riled up and almost like it's a, it's a play. We're watching a Broadway play. And when push comes to shove, how do we know the United States hasn't just gone and said, look, we know you're going to take Taiwan one day and it'll, it'll look like a proxy war. Just go ahead and take it. Um, kind of like what's going on in the Ukraine. We'll, we'll send Taiwan weapons and <clears throat> we'll do that. But I think China and the U.S. just have too much money and power tied up to want to go head to head and destroy each other. And I do believe we're at a point where money and power just dictates everything. We don't want to destroy each other. We're trying to find ways to get paid. We're trying to find ways to get more power. And I, just, I wouldn't even put it past anyone anymore to say Taiwan would end up being a pawn at the end of the day. Because if you look at our own government, it's like, well, do we believe in one China or not? And this whole trip, it's like, why Pelosi? Why now? All this turmoil and drama and all this crap, why? This trip didn't need to happen. And if it did need to happen, why her? So, this is what makes you question everything. It's like, either we're the most incompetent government on the planet, or there's some other shit going on in the background, as always, that we'll just never know about. But it was nice to hear the pod all question, why her, why now, why there? It just, it was like this farewell tour. Like, I, I don't understand. But, I don't know, that's my thoughts anyways. Just some uh, extra random insights on, was it episode 90 here? Um, I think we got still 12, 18 months of who knows what coming our way. And if... If Freebird laid out 10 things, one or two of those are going to happen. And that's how I've been living for the last year. Just kind of proceed with caution. See what happens with Russia and Ukraine. See what... I, again, I feel Russia's got some plan. Doesn't mean it's going to work. But they're working on doing something. And they're going to screw with Europe when it comes to the energy. They were talking about France having to shut down some nuclear plants or reduce capacity because... The temperatures are so hot. There's all these plays going on and the pipelines. And now we got China doing like, man, there's so much stuff out there. The tipping point might only be one or two of these things happening for everything else to unravel. So while I see the stock market up and the jobs are strong and I hope it keeps going, I'm just afraid that there's too many bad things out there that it's impossible that one or two of them um, won't happen. So we'll see. Anyways, that's all I got for this one. I'll catch you on the next one.